Good afternoon, uh, everybody who is listening in uh, at this uh, presentation. Uh, it's named a Conceptual Framework for Data-Driven Logistics, Fruits and Vegetables in a Supply Chain. It's a quite a long title, but uh, we will get in depth during this presentation. Again, first of all, welcome to everybody. I could imagine it's quite a challenge to choose the right or the, the most interesting uh, presentation. And let me assure you, you did. So uh, I think we have quite a, something to tell. Before I start with the topic, what it's all about, I just have some introductory uh, uh, remarks. Well, probably what everybody already heard is that this, this presentation will be in English. That's uh, not because we really like to talk English, but uh, my co-host, that is Jujan Guo, and my colleague is also uh, presenting, and he's not a native speaking uh, Dutch guy, so we choose to, to go for English. So he makes it a little bit difficult for, for me. So that's that's first thing. The other thing is that we have a presentation of 45 minutes. We will try to do it in 35 minutes, and that gives us the opportunity to answer your questions, if you have any. You can raise your question or uh, uh, upload your question in the, the question uh, chat function. It's open, so uh, when you're logged in, you, are, you should be able to see it. Just put in there your question, and we will uh, pick the right ones or the, the nice ones or the difficult ones, and we will uh, answer that at the end of this, this presentation. Well, as I said, it is in English, and these slides will be uh, made available later on, so maybe tomorrow or the day after, uh, via this same system. So uh, well, you can write and, and, and make print screens, but you don't really have to. So. Uh, now we have the introduction done, so what is it all about? And I'd like to, to, to start with this, this picture. As I said, the title is about uh, fresh supply chains, so it's fruits and vegetables. And what I think it's, and that's recognizable, recognizable for most of you, I think, I hope, is that this is the kind of strawberry that you really like to buy and preferably also really like to eat. Why is it? It's nice, or in this case it's very big. But it's nice, it's red, it, it looks good. Probably it also smells good when you, you enter the supermarket and, and you, you see it lying on the shelves and you anticipate that it also will taste good, so very sweet. So this is the type of quality that you want to buy and want to eat. And in that sense, we are all consumers and we are all experts that we also know that well, it won't stay in this shape for a long time. For strawberries, especially when you keep it out of the fridge, it will take maybe three, four days, and then you end up, what you see on, uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, a, a product that you probably do not want to eat. So this is the challenge huh, that we face every day when we buy a, a fresh fruit or vegetables. It's a challenge for consumer, but it's also a challenge for a supply chain, as you could imagine. And I just printed it in a, in a simple graph. So uh, what are we facing every day? So what are you facing when you're doing your, your groceries, you do your shopping, you buy your groceries, is that you start at a certain initial quality. You see, uh, in this case, the strawberries lying on the shelf. You say, well, this is the quality that I really like to buy at the moment that you are in the shop. And somewhere during time, uh, the quality will go down. That is inevitable, this is a fact of life, and it will not go up in any sense, so it will go down. And then you see the gray area on this slide, and then there is a time frame where it is the right time to consume your strawberries. When you consume them too early, probably they are not as sweet as you want, or not as soft as you want, when you want to consume it uh, below, uh, probably it doesn't look that nice anymore. So you have to choose, you have to find out when to eat. So in that sense, we are all experts because we know more or less when to eat it. And what if your planning is a little bit out of order? What if you are anticipated of eating it today, but something comes in between, your children have to go to whatever, and then you want to keep them for a longer time. So you want to lengthen shelf life. And again, then we are all experts because we try to do something, and what do we do in the most time, most of the time, we put our strawberries in the refrigerator. So we cool it, eh? we try to lengthen the shelf life. So we are in that sense optimizing our uh, home, eh, our kitchen logistics. So we anticipate it on, an, on a certain 
quality at a certain moment. I was not able to reach that quality at that moment. So I try to lengthen shelf life. I try to Im not improve, but uh, keep the quality at a, at a higher level. So this is, in essence, what we are doing as a consumer. But this is, in essence, what all the players in the supply chain for fresh fruits and vegetables are also doing. They're anticipating on this slope, downward slope, and they anticipate on not getting below the gray area. And you can do that with cooling and all other kind of techniques. What you also see is that we anticipate on it, so we want to prevent that it goes to a certain level of quality decay. So we want to cool it just in case. So we want to pack it just in case. So we do not use the fact that we know how, it, how quality changes, but we just do things just in case and to prevent. And that is, well, the essence, the basic of, of this, this presentation of today is what you see. What we do in logistics most of the time is that we want to control it just on logistics. So we have a prediction on an availability prediction, as you can see on the, on the right hand side of this, this picture, the slide. And we anticipate on a certain uh, availability and then we make decisions on that availability and then we decide where to store it, how to store it, and where to keep it, and how to keep it. So that's logistics. We not, do not look at the product itself, not the quality. And now, what's the big change? And the big change, uh, well, maybe it doesn't seem that big change, is that what on the left-hand side of this, uh, this figure is what if we are also able to predict quality? And we make decisions based on the fact that quality changes over time. So we do not only prevent it, but we know, because a strawberry is an organic product, it's a biological product, and one strawberry is not the same as the other strawberry. So quality will always differ. What if I have that knowledge and I can do something during the, the optimization of my supply chain? That is, in essence, what we are researching and what we are talking about today. And what we also think, uh, later on I will show, who are, it's not only me, but the other people that also think uh, that the time is there, is because we know that uh, the product quality degradation, uh, so quality goes down, that's a fact, that's a fact of life, we all know that. We also know that we more or less can sense, predict, and control the product quality. We, we know uh, by all kinds of sensors and all kinds of devices, uh, when we see a certain firmness or we detect a certain uh, smell uh, even by, by uh, sensors, that quality goes down a little bit faster than maybe we anticipated. So we can sense it. We also, I think we all realize, and people that are listening in, I also, they, they probably think, and I hope they're thinking, well, we could control the supply chain once we know that. So once we know it, once we are able to sense it, then we can control based on the supply of, on product quality and product quality decay. The next step, and that's the, the, the tricky one, uh, what we say and what we uh, are telling you today is that you need, in that sense, a, a collaborative and integrated data-driven network decision-making. It's a mouthful, it's, it's a long sentence, but what we say, in essence, is you have to work together as a supply chain as a whole. Uh, one entity in supply chain probably doesn't make the difference. And you need a lot of data. You need a lot of real-time data. And you need a lot of data maybe on product level, maybe on cargo level. So it's, it's really getting the data across and, and using it. That is what we are facing today. And we believe technology is there. Internet of Things is one of the, the technology that's out there for a long time already. But now is the time that we really could make this step. And who is we? Well. Uh, as, as a researcher, we see this as a relevant type of research. We really want to go a deep dive in, in this, this uh, th way of thinking. So we are granted an uh, NWO project, but it's not only us, that will say TNO uh, and Wageningen University and Research, uh, the, the two research uh, organizations that really believe in it, but it's all the other parties, so it's all business parties that really also believe that the time is here and, and, and that we really have to organize ourselves as a supply chain and to look at what are the possibilities. So that's the research relevant. What I also said is the business relevant and I just took some quotes of the, from the people that uh, were in, in the meetings and uh, uh, also uh, 
working within us, uh, together with us, uh, within this, uh, this project. For example, that's Van Oos, it's a huge organization uh, that is uh, supplying, uh, well, most people in the Netherlands, uh, for example, with, with green beans, but also with mangoes and uh, all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And what they say, it, I highlighted it, is that they want control. Eh? They want control in their supply chain and they want to guarantee a certain quality. Eh? Just the slope, as I mentioned before. So that's really for them why they are here, why they are a part of this project. When you look at Europol Systems, eh? that's the organization that is uh, it's organizing all the, the, the crates that's moving around in uh, the world, filled with uh, most of the time with fresh fruits and vegetables. They also see that their clients want to control the supply chain and they, and they want to know what's going on in the supply chain. And they say, well, our crates are probably one of the, the, the devices or the, 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 the parts that we can use in the chain to embed the sensors so that you're able to, to really know what's going on in the supply chain. Then one of the other is AMS. They are developing the, the sensors that are needed and especially, well, I don't want to go into detail, but it's uh, ethylene is, is one of the, 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 if you can sense ethylene, it's very crucial for most of the quality decay because uh, ethylene is, uh, when quality goes down, of a lot of products, they produce ethylene. So you, uh, once you are able to sense it, then you know something about quality and quality decay. Only the fact is the sensors are this big and you need it at the end, small as this, or it may be small as this. So that's also what we want to organize in this, uh, to realize in this uh, project. It's not only theory, but also developing the technology. And then the quote of uh, TNO, well, that's not only research-wise, but also they want to help the sector, just like we li like to help the, the sector, is to uh, really go into the digital transformation. And again, and I'm repeating myself maybe a little bit, but the time is here, the time is right, and we think and believe that we can do it now. So it's research relevance, as a researcher, of course, so it's business relevance, and also shown by the quotes, but also with all the other parties participating. But it's also sustainability relevance, as I just call it now. I just put in two, uh, the world vegetable maps and the world fruit maps uh, from the Rabobank, and it just shows what we are doing with all our products all over the world. So we, it's moving around from one place to another. So uh, supply chains are long, it's, it's all fresh produce, it's all perishable produce. So that's quite something, uh, not only business-wise, but quite some volumes that we have to, uh, to cope with. And you could imagine when you are not able to control product quality-wise your supply chain, that it can lead to a lot of food loss and food waste, for example, or misuse of, of cooling, so energy misuse, or uh, other type of, of transportation uh, costs that you have to make that you maybe shouldn't make because you have some more insight about the quality decay. So it's also the relevance in uh, looking at sustainability. So those three combined, we think and the business think we have to, to move forward and we can move forward. So this is from my side just the, the setting the scene, uh, telling you a little bit what it's all about. Well, I hand over the, the microphone and the, the clicker to my colleague. He will do the deep dive into the, the framework behind it. So. I will move out, and he will move in. Thank you very much, uh, Just for your nice introduction. Uh, so this is the basic idea about IoT uh, for agriculture. Uh, so as you can see, along the uh, post harvest chain, uh, there are different infrastructure can enable uh, the, the, the quality control along the whole uh, uh, supply chain. Then I start with the uh, transition trend uh, which is happening now. So basically we now transit from the traditional cold chain logistic to a more data-driven quality controlled logistic. Uh, cold chain logistic focuses mainly on the refrigerated technology and the equipment because that's the core of their business. However, data-driven quality controlled logistic focus more on data analysis, basically how to use the available technology in a smart way to improve the efficiency of your supply chain. And uh, the cold chain logistic has a passive static management miner, which means uh, in this uh, supply chain, all the parameter 
value has been already fixed for the condition in the transportation or storage. However, uh, for the data-driven quality control logistic, we have the chance to intervene uh, the, qu uh, the quality or other conditional parameters uh, during the logistic activities. So that's why we call it uh, active dynamic management uh, scheme. So because of this uh, passive uh, management manner, uh, there, the traditional coaching logistics leave a uh, very small room for logistic optimization because you have to deal with these fixed parameter values. However, for the data-driven quality control logistics, you can really change the parameter value that will give you more freedom and flexibility to uh, optimize your supply chain. And the traditional cold uh, chain logistics does not have a very high uh, demand for real-time uh, data communication because the data collected mainly for the post ant analysis of your supply chain. That does not require very fast, uh, very advanced uh, IT infrastructure. However, for the data-driven quality control logistic, uh, it requires a very advanced uh, IT infrastructure, maybe 5G or 6, uh, 6G. Uh, IT uh, communication uh, infrastructure because uh, real-time data needs to be collected and communicated. So because of this uh, time-demanding minor for the data-driven uh, su uh, supply chain, uh, there is an important role that uh, quality sensor can play to realize that. The quality sensor can uh, enable the sensing and recording the environmental parameter for the product in a real-time and a continuous manner. So it can also use this data to predict the remaining shelf life uh, with the quality decay model embedded in it. That will provide the decision maker uh, about the quality of the product on hand for the real moment. That uh, will give them a chance to reorganize their uh, logistic act activities uh, to do this uh, impro improvement uh, continuously. And th therefore, real data uh, transmission is required, uh, desirably to uh, integrate it into a central control platform. Then there, all the information integrated, then decision maker can make uh, the decision on time. And uh, the logistic optimization based on the uh, real-time product quality data can really improve the efficiency of the whole supply chain. So if we compare the traditional quality control with the sensor-based quality control, we can see some big difference. The traditional quality control normally happens in the, uh, at a different milestone time point. For example, the time when you're harvesting the product uh, or the time you're moving the product into the cold storage. However, for the sensor-based quality control, you can monitor data continuously along your supply chain. Um, because of uh, the uh, post ant analysis requirement for the traditional uh, quality control, so it does not need real-time communication, so the, it, the delayed data communication is okay. However, for the sensor-based quality control, it enables the uh, on-time data communication, so therefore you can really have the data on time before you can make the decision to intervene the current uh, uh, supply chain, uh, current logistic activity to, to reorganize your uh, logistic operation. And uh, the traditional quality control relying heavily on the expert experience because uh, not all the data uh, you gathered can be uh, explained by itself. You need the effort to do the judgment. However, for the sensor-based quality control, because you cannot involve expert continuously in this quality judgment, therefore it relies heavily on the quality decay model. So quality decay model is the key. So this is one example of the quality decay model. As you can see here, uh, for different temperature, uh, the product uh, will decrease, uh, the quality of the product will decrease following different trajectory. So it can be described by a logistic regression function, logistic curve. 
Um, so you can see the model at uh, uh, 9 degree actually is the worst uh, model. So if you can uh, lower the temperature to 4 degree, then you actually can gain extra shelf life by almost 4 days. That's uh, what the quality key model can tell you. And based on the previous concept and the, the, the quality uh, decay model description, we develop a generic uh, procedure for sensor-based quality control logistics in the daily logistic operations. Uh, so the first uh, uh, question is, what type of a sensor you should use in your supply chain? Uh, is it the isolin sensor or it's a thermal sensor or relative humidity sensor? So the, as the use just said, the isolin sensor is very big and very expensive, but they can provide you some extra information in addition to temperature and the relative humidity. Maybe that information is very crucial. It's worthwhile to uh, investigate, to collect this data. Uh, then you also need to, after you determine which sensor you are going to use, you also need to determine in which chain link you want to use it. For example, in transportation or in the distribution center or in the store. And also the level of uh, the sensor application also need to be determined. So you want to apply the sensor uh, to the container level to uh, measure the average uh, uh, product quality for one full container, or you want to measure the product quality on the product level, or even on a box or crate level. So this selection has a huge impact on the cost benefits of your supply chain, which need to be carefully analyzed. So basically, before you do any implementation for the sensor application scheme, you need to conduct cost-benefit analysis on this scheme. So basically, you can do that by a pilot experiment, so small scale, just to test, uh, to prove the concept. Um, and you can also try to scale it up to a more realistic situation by using simulation model, because that simulation model can mimic the real life situation without really enter your product or without really implement your scheme already in your real life business. That will save a lot of uh, cost of error. Um, so after you determine a good uh, uh, sensor application scheme, then you can implement that in the, your real life business. There, what is in the center is the integrated information management system or platform that can integrate all the data uh, relevant to logistic activity, like logistical data, so basically related to what kind of modality you have uh, and what's the capacity of your uh, modality, this kind of information. And also you have other data, so where you should ship the data to and what's the condition, what's the specification of this product. Then based on the real-time data on product quality, which actually the date based on the data you gather uh, with by the sensor and translated by your quality key model, you can know the remaining shelf life of your product. So then you combine all these three types of products, you which provide you a, a very good base to make a decision to intervene your logistics activities for the current shipment or for the current batch of product. So this uh, intervention can be made by computer automatically, but it also can be made by a human. Uh, so human can, you can also have a human to control the flow, to redirect the flow based on the quality and also logistic and also ordering data. So in addition to uh, adding the value to the daily uh, logistic operation, Actually, the quality uh, data can also be used to uh, enabling the long-term strategic uh, network design for your supply chain. What I mean, the long-term uh, quality decay data, that means you can analyze your supply chain, uh, the quality uh, data in your supply chain, maybe for one year, then you can know from which lane, uh, to, uh, from which uh, origin to which destination, what's the average quality is there. So it's a, it's a yearly average, then it gives you uh, e, uh, 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 overview about the average quality for each lane in your network. Then you can accordingly to update your supply chain network. 
because the traditional supply uh, chain network design, they do not consider uh, the shelf life into their design. So basically, you can combine the quality every accumulated quality decay data with your supplier data, with your order data, shipment data, and DC store data. Then you can map the baseline of your uh, business, of your supply chain operation uh, in the last year, for example. And then you can, based on the gather uh, parameter value, you can optimize your, your current supply chain based on the baseline situation using some uh, optimization model. And uh, after you have the optimal current scenario, you can also derive the optimal future scenario based on the, your future business development perspective. So if we use this, uh, uh, if we embed this uh, quality key model to the network design, then we actually enable the, to configure our supply chain not only based on the traditional logistic cost, but also based on the quality and the shelf life of the product. For example, we can decide we put in the DC with a highly perishable product closer to the market, to a location. Then we can reduce the quality decay, uh, the chance of quality decay uh, in the outbound uh, shipment. So this kind of uh, issue can be handled by the quality embedded network design. And this is the two, uh, uh, this is the one example for uh, the output uh, performance of two different uh, central, uh, two different uh, network scenarios. So on the left hand side, it is a centralized scenario. As you can see here, the red triangle actually is the original uh, distribution center or uh, depot, and the green triangle are the newly added uh, consolidation uh, central distribution center. Uh, so basically, the right-hand side is called the decentralized scenario because we add more uh, new uh, centralized uh, the, uh, uh, distribution center into the map. So the left-hand side, we add three green triangles. The right-hand side, we uh, add 11 green triangles. So therefore, we can compare these two scenarios in terms of uh, different KPIs like uh, cost, like uh, the closing to market, also, we can look into some uh, specific uh, KPI that's only available when you take into account the product quality in your network design. For example, what is the average quality uh, you can ensure in this uh, network uh, for the product at the consumer end? So that's the last uh, parameter value. So based on this uh, uh, sensor-based uh, op op uh, operation or sensor-based uh, network uh, uh, design, we can observe some new opportunity to pump, pump up in the future. For example, we can maximize the product quality by remotely control the conditions according to real-time product uh, situation. So this is, will provide the room for the decision maker or the, for the logistic practitioners to organize the supply chain in the real time based on the real time data for product quality. Um, and uh, it all can also be used to optimize the order of the product issuing. If we know the product quality, we can issue the product based on the, uh, the uh, remaining shelf life. So for example, first it paired, first out. That will maximize the product quality of, uh, for your uh, goods. Therefore you can gain the maximum benefit from your uh, product. And then we can also redirect in the good flow to different market based on the product quality information. For example, if we have some uh, big uh, uh, temperature violation during, uh, the period, during the logistic activity, then we know the product uh, quality has been already decayed to some point. Then we have to redirect the product flow maybe not to the original high in the market, but to a market that accepts low quality product or uh, even uh, yeah, bad product. Um, yeah, and then we can also use this model to determine the optimal stock level in the DC and the store. So if we only determine the stock level based on the demand, then we can, uh, sometimes we can underestimate uh, uh, the, 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 or, overestimate the real 
real, the really demanded uh, inventory level. But if you incorporate the shelf life, then you know, okay, if I have that amount of uh, stock, safety stock in uh, the store um, or in the DC, then what's the, the expected the losses uh, we can expect it. That will determine how much uh, safety stock we need to put into our inventory. Because uh, it's not like uh, everything you put in your inventory will be staying there uh, until it, uh, it will be issued to fulfill demand. Because some of the uh, product will be uh, already expired before it can uh, reach the consumer. So this you have to include this parameter in. Then you can really calculate the optimal stock level uh, considering the product quality. And also we can use this uh, uh, model to, or use this thinking to lower the food loss waste in the DC and the store because you can calculate the optimal level inventory that minimizes the food loss waste but still uh, maintain the service level and the demand, fulfills the demand. And another uh, very interesting uh, contribution that quality control logistics can make is it can help lower the energy consumption and the CO2 emission. Because for a lot of products, actually during the, its transportation or storage, sometimes it does not need a very low temperature or uh, always uh, 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 stick to one temperature. Sometimes you can adjust the temperature or other uh, condition parameters based on the real demand of the product be according to the real-time quality. So sometimes then you can even higher the temperature a little bit, uh, then you save the energy. So we already have this kind of example for refer container, what we call a dynamic uh, temperature control that can save a lot of energy. Uh, of course, then uh, also CO2 emissions. And in this, uh, with, with this uh, quality control logistic, we can also accelerate uh, the supply chain based on uh, the anticipated product quality. For example, we can provide extra service at port and uh, for the fast track. Um, we can also proceed, uh, or the process can also be speeded, speeded up at the trader uh, and the cross docking. We are also selecting, uh, select the, the transport modality based on the quality of the product. Uh, we can also selecting the location of DC and facilities based on the long-term average quality shelf life of the product in the strategic network design, as I have already mentioned before. So besides the things we already mentioned, there are also three very important points we need to uh, bear in mind. First of all, to enable quality control logistics, we have to set up the quality reference standard for fruits and vegetables. Uh, we already have a quite a good uh, standard, quality standard for our horticulture uh, sector in the Netherlands. So basically, uh, it's very clear for different uh, flowers, uh, what's the, 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 the class it belongs to, it's very clear. However, for fruits and vegetables, it's not uh, clear yet. There are no established, uh, well, uh, well uh, accepted uh, standards there. Uh, still heavily based on expert uh, uh, judgment and uh, also some uh, uh, standard only accepted by some company in the supply chain, maybe. Um, so this is very important to establish uh, uh, quite a uniform standard that can be uh, uh, applied to the whole supply chain. And another issue to apply this uh, um, data-driven quality control logistic is we have to improve the trust between the players for data sharing. Because data-driven supply chain means you need to make the data flow very fluent uh, in the supply chain. So even one entity, one isolate in the supply chain uh, do, is a black hole for the data, then you cannot optimize the supply chain at all. So therefore, it's very important to have this data sharing scheme. Uh, so basically, data Privacy pr uh, protection is very important because some, especially the quality data, some are very uh, important for the company's business. They are actually related to their core competence of business. How can we enable that? Only the data that can be shared with the chain players will be shared. 
uh, to reach its maximum potential uh, to be used to uh, improve the uh, supply chain performance, but at the same time protect the, the, the data, uh, the core data of the individual company. And also there must be a fair rewarding scheme in this supply chain for data sharing. Because, uh, yeah, if I share my data, I expect some rewarding or some uh, yeah, benefit from it. If there are no uh, benefit uh, or clear benefit, maybe uh, the chain player will be reluctant to share their data. And the last thing, uh, very important, is the resilience for the digitalized supply chains. We know the resilience uh, uh, for supply chains is a very important issue nowadays. But for the digitalized supply chain, uh, the resilience is even more important because we are now relying on the IT system or the computer uh, heavily to organize the supply chain. That means if one component of this IT infrastructure uh, break down or, or have some problem, then maybe the whole system will be collapsed because uh, the computer are less flexible than human. Therefore, we suggest that even though maybe in the future we have the chance to have a fully digitalized supply chain, even use some uh, AI technology to really reorganize your supply chain, we still recommend that we retain some level of human intervention because uh, fully automation uh, sometimes maybe uh, means low resilience. Uh, also, it's very important to have a backup system. If we have one system collapse, we have other system to be used in, as an uh, alternative uh, uh, yeah, option. Yeah, that's my presentation. So uh, now you can ask questions. We are pleased to uh, answer <laughs> questions. Yeah. Should I go? Back again. Uh, now I'm keeping the, the corona distance. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I was looking at the chat, so uh, well, it didn't explode, so uh, there is still room to do, uh, and time to answer some questions. We have, uh, well, I saw in the chat that in the beginning there was some hiccup uh, with the recording, so I don't hope that people miss uh, a lot at the beginning. Otherwise, still, uh, as I mentioned, all the uh, slides will be available at the end. There is also our email number, so you can contact us with, with more uh, questions. And as we said, also this. This uh, project is, is running now for, uh, let's say, three quarters of a year, but we're really going into uh, demonstrations. So what was just mentioned, uh, that we like to do this, want to do that, is what we're really going to do to demonstrate and, and show the supply chain. The question that is uh, that came in, it's, uh, I don't know uh, for privacy reasons if I can mention all the names, but it's uh, Monique at least, and she's asking, and I'll ask a question because I'm more right to uh, my colleague uh, is in, she asked uh, how, between brackets, but how do you take into account the uncertainty of your prediction the quality into the logistic optimization? So in general, her question is, as I translated this, uh, how do you take uncertainty into account? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, for the biological products, uh, the largest uh, uncertainty actually come from the uh, biological variety of the product. So the quality decay model uh, prediction is relying heavily on the um, homogeneity of the, your batch. So if you have a, a batch of uh, products with a very uh, uh, large uh, quality distribution, it's very hard to make good prediction. But uh, yeah, the, if the, the, the biological variation is uh, less, then the prediction can be more accurate. Uh, of course, this is a, a issue um, not easy to solve, but uh, yeah, in the future, I think uh, when we can have a more individual based uh, uh, monitoring, then we can be more accurate. Because the higher level you go, the, you only uh, mon uh, measure the average, then the less accurate uh, uh, related to individual you can reach. So that's, um, yeah, that's, a, that's a currently uh, is, a, uh, is drawback of this uh, quality decay predictive model. Uh, of course, the uncertainty is not only uh, coming from the product quality, but also other uh, uncertainties within the, uh, your supply chain. 
For this, to capture this uncertainty, uh, we can use a simulation model to do Monster Color simulation, for example, because we do not uh, uh, yeah, calculate one uh, parameter value, but we calculate a distribution of parameter value to capture the real life uncertainty. This kind of technology can be used to capture that. Yeah. So what we use, in essence, is uh, to get rid of uncertainty in general. Uh, when you do some predictions, uh, like Niels Bohr, I think. The quote is uh, addressed to him that he says, well, uh, predicting is difficult, especially when it's about the future. So that's also in this case. What we say, and the things that we also want to research on, what level do you want to sense? So it's uh, maybe you have to put a sensor on every individual strawberry. It says a little bit more, uh, more accurate, about, accurate about that individual product. But you can imagine that's quite costly. Maybe it's not eatable yet, the sensor. Uh, they are available, uh, I can say. And otherwise, uh, there's still that uh, biological variance. So that's yeah, it's something we have to cope with. But it's the new techniques of uh, statistics that we want to, to apply in this, in this, uh, this research, at least. Well, uh, I was in meanwhile updating, giving the answer uh, if there are coming new questions in. So, and I just look. No, there are no more questions. So and I don't think we have to fill in the time asking questions to each other. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, well, signing in and calling in in this, uh, this presentation. I hope that uh, we triggered at least the, the thought in your, your mind about quality uh, decay and how to cope, it, cope with it within your supply chain, especially when you go to the supermarket and see strawberries laying around from, from now. So thanks again. Maybe also thanks my colleague, of course. And uh, well, I think we sign out for this uh, this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.